What do you think, Chris? Should we get started? Yeah. All right. Uh, Well, we've been waiting for you to get us started with the prayer, if you wouldn't mind. (laughs) Mind getting us started? Uh, Sure. (laughs) Heavenly Father, I thank you for Todd, letting him be here and guide us in the study and revelations. Uh, Revelation, thank you for uh, your word. I pray that it will have good influence in our lives and we come to know you better in your plan for our time and uh, for the time to come. It's in your precious uh, name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. So it's been two weeks. So why don't we do this? Let's go back to where we left off last time. Let's go to Revelation 19 because there's so much going on in Revelation 19 that it's kind of a a summary focal climax point for a, a lot of the things that we've been looking at together, even going back into Genesis and what happened after the flood of Noah and the rise of the population and the establishment of nations at the Tower of Babel. And then the uh, dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which was a prophecy of the fate of nations. But then also Genesis 12, uh, this man named Abram was called out of the nations and he crossed over and received very specific promises by the creator, primarily that of his seed would be made a great nation in the land. And then all of the promises made to Israel that followed played out all throughout history until we get to Messiah. And then picking up, and we're going to hopefully have time to get into that tonight, maybe touch on a couple of the parables of Messiah. And then what that is pointing towards events in the future. And like we talked about in the first couple of of, um, sessions, there's a number of ways of looking at the book of Revelation. And the way that we're working at it together is thematically looking at the difference between the two women of Revelation, the bride and the harlot, and taking the futurist view that the abundance of evidence is that the majority of these things that we're going to even read about tonight lie in our future, not in our past, as the preterists, um, as the preterists uh, argue. Now, that's just what we're doing. So that's kind of the, the uh, maybe this is all wrong. However, that's our approach. We're looking at promises to the seed of Abraham different than the promises of the future of the nations, and looking at a number of events that will culminate as promised that lie in our human future. So with that kind of framework, let's go back to chapter 19, and let's read the whole chapter again together because it pulls so many of the things that we've been pulling from Old Testament and New Testament as the climax of what is happening around the bride and the people uh, associated with the bride, and what is happening with the harlot, and the people associated with the harlot. So somebody take 19 for us. Let's read that again. I will. Thank you. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are His judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants. You who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Then I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. 
With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with a sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Thank you. I mean, wow. Every time I read that, I mean, Netflix is boring compared to that. I mean, that drama, that climax, and everything that's mixed in at the same time. So this rider on the white horse, who is this? It says the word of God is his name. But if you go back to John, mm -hmm. the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word became it is the promised coming return of the Messiah. So this is the second coming. Now, of course, those who anticipate a second coming also believe what? There was a first coming. So... That's all through scripture. It was not only prophesied all through the prophets and all through the Old Testament. And then not only did Messiah talk about it, the apostles talked about it, about this coming of the king. Now here, the conquering king, and is that not what we see? And so this is what we probably suspect, at least some people believe clearly, this is the day of Yahuwah, the day of the Lord. And all of these aspects that were described in all of the prophets as when the conquering king comes, this is what happens to the harlot and to the people associated with the harlot in that system. And, but not only is it that, in this great drama, I mean, I mean the language here, uh, not only the, um, uh, the fire and brimstone and destruction of the beast and the false prophet, but also the great winepress of God and the great supper of the great God where the kings of the earth that turn against him are destroyed and their flesh eaten by the birds. I mean, the drama is so specific, right? But in the midst of all that, we also have the reward and the wedding feast of the groom who is this conquering Messiah and his bride. And then all the people associated with the bride at the wedding feast. And so you have exactly what's been promised, reward and righteous judgment. And so in this context, ver or chapter 19 brings a lot of these elements together at a climax. So that's where we off left, left off last uh, two weeks ago. So as we go into Revelation 20, we're going to get more information and even some structure on how this is going to play out. But before we go into the details of Re uh, Revelation 20, I want to dwell a little bit on this concept, uh, starting with the Great Commission. So here, going back to here, before Messiah, before His death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension, He was speaking with His disciples. 
and he was teaching them. And then here in Mark chapter 16, he says this, later he, Messiah, Jesus, appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he does, does not believe will be condemned. So there's the great commission, right? Go unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I just want to dwell on that for just a moment as before we get into to chapter 12. And let's just start with this question. What is that gospel? So the great commission to his disciples is to go unto all the world and preach the gospel. What is that gospel? Christ crucified. Christ crucified. And there's a lot baked into that, right? Because not just any Christ, because many came claiming to be the Christ. How do we know that he's actually the one? He rose. Not only did he prophesy, fulfill all these prophecies, 28 prophecies in one 24-hour period, the crucifixion day, but he also fulfilled the sign of Jonah for three days and three nights. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, he was in the belly of the earth, but was resurrected, and we have eyewitness accounts to give us that story. So yes, so, so there's a lot baked into what you said. Christ resurrected. Is that the whole and the fullness of the gospel? Yes, and it, he is, he's there to save you, to give you eternal life. Yeah, for what purpose? For dealing with sin, right? Yeah. Right? Consider this. What gospel did the Messiah teach? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take us in a very specific direction. I'm totally setting you up. But what gospel did the Messiah teach? Does that just come to mind as we dwell on that question? Which gospel did he teach? Repentance and forgiveness of sin. Definitely, right? Let's go to his words, though. Now, we're going to dwell on this concept of the kingdom. So Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So which gospel, at least in this one, one example, which gospel did he preach? The gospel of the kingdom of God. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what we'll find is when we look at all of the parables and all the references to the kingdom in the book of Matthew, Matthew uses the word heaven, kingdom of heaven. Uh, Mark, Luke, and John use the word kingdom of God. It's the same term, same parables, but so the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God is the same kingdom. But let's dwell on this for a second. How about in Luke? Luke chapter 4, verse 42. Now, when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. When he sent out the twelve, Luke chapter 9. Verse 1, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure their diseases. He sent to them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Let's kind of dwell on this. Why did Messiah speak in parables? To help uh, people understand. It was easier to give examples than to... It, thing about teaching children, you teach them by giving them examples rather than just telling them facts and figures. Mm -hmm. So to help them understand. Maybe. Oh, so, and, 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 and this is, a, it's an interesting question that we don't talk about a lot. Was it to make a complex thing easy for everybody to understand? Or was it to conceal the truth? There's a couple things in here. Let's go, let's go to Mark chapter 4. So again, the question is, why did Messiah speak to the people in parables? Mark chapter 4, verse 10. 
But when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable that he had just given. And he said to them, to you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all things come in parables so that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. So here we, he said a lot, right? One, this thing called the kingdom of God, by design, it is obvious for everybody or it's a mystery? mystery. It's a mystery only to those who seek. What else, what else does it say? Seek and you will find. So one, this whole thing called the kingdom of God is a mystery by design. Why? So that for those who aren't seeking, they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. But that's why he spoke to them in parables to, just read it again in his words, to you has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. But this isn't also interest, interesting that according to him, the parables are all about the what? The kingdom. <clears throat> the kingdom. Okay, so the kingdom. How important is it, really? Matthew 6, 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The preeminence of the kingdom, whatever that is. I, you know, it strikes me that if he starts talking about the kingdom of God, everyone's going to come at it with their preconceived notions of what a kingdom is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with multiple opinions, yes? Yeah. yeah. So then he starts spouting nonsense about what a kingdom of heaven is like, and he's going to be utterly confusing to people. <laughs> it's like, why do you have to explain to us what the kingdom of heaven is? It's pretty obvious. We know what the kingdom of heaven is. But how do we know? Right? How do we know? In today's day and age, do we know primarily from the impressions that we got as a child from Disney? Where do we get our impressions? And if we end up with six different options, how can we prove which one is true? It's all in here. We have to let Scripture interpret Scripture to wrestle that bear, mm -hmm. I would propose. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just thinking, like, in the seats of those who are... It just became out to me, it's like, why would even Jesus even have to tell people parables about what the kingdom of God is like? Yeah. yeah. Well... They have it confused. I mean, if they had a, a skewed view, view of what kingdoms were and what even his coming was going to be. Yeah. You know, their idea of heaven wasn't always the mystical place. And, and I think that, that you bring up a really, really good point, is the topic brings up the question, well, what is the kingdom of heaven? And then when you pursue that, we're going to get more than one answer in the marketplace, right? Maybe hundreds. So if we consider hundreds of answers to the question, how do we prove which one is closest to the truth best that we can understand? That's the authority of Scripture, letting Scripture answer the question. And that's going to be our approach. Now, we'll see how far we get, but that's going to be our approach. But again, isn't it interesting that every time in Scripture, when the Messiah so far is talking about the gospel, it's the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And when he sent out his 12, they were to preach the kingdom of God. And he said, I must leave this city and go to these cities also to preach the kingdom of God, for this is why I was sent. So he emphasized the kingdom. Okay, one more. And of course, there's more here. But just, this is just to kind of dwell on this concept of the kingdom. How about this question? When will the end of the age come? And of course, this takes us to Matthew 24, because that was the opening question in the beginning of the chapter 24. What are these things, and, and what will these things, uh, what will happen at the time of the end, at the end of the age? And so he begins to, to answer that question. When we get to verse 13, he says this, But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. And to your point, 
after his ascension, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, right here, while the gospels were being written and the epistles were being written, immediately did different versions of the kingdom, did, did different versions of the gospel, did different versions of Jesus multiply <laughs> and get spread everywhere? It did. Second Corinthians, this is what Paul was writing in the second letter to Corinth was about. And he says this, and this is interesting because it also gets into our theme. Starting in verse 2, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Which is exactly what chapter 19 in Revelation we just read about. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. So your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received. Or even a different gospel which you had not accepted, you may put up with it. So already here, there were multiple Jesuses, multiple gospels, multiple spirits. How do you prove the promised Messiah separate from and different all the counterfeits? <clears throat> it's all in here. It's all in here. That's the only way that we can prove it. So is the kingdom important? I wanted to dwell on that. We're going to get into chapter 20 now. But I wanted to dwell on that just because what we just read, seek first the primacy of the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. Now, so far as we've gotten, it looks as though you can't talk about the kingdom without talking about the price paid, the blood of Christ, dealing with sin, creator's plan for humanity. You can't talk about the kingdom without all of those things. But can you talk about all of these things without the kingdom? I think we frequently do. We frequently talk about the gospel, but less about the kingdom. But he's making very, very important the gospel of the kingdom. Messiah came to preach the kingdom of God. He sent his disciples to preach the kingdom of God. He spoke in parables to hide the mystery of the kingdom of God for those who, from those who are not seeking it. And the gospel of the kingdom will be a witness to all the world and then the end of the age. So it's the importance of the kingdom. And that's what we're about to read. So let's do this. Let's open up Revelation chapter 20. And, he, and in this, I want to just kind of anticipate a couple of themes. In here, it's going to describe Satan being bound and his ability to deceive humanity ceased because he is bound. We're also going to get some details on this thing called the kingdom of God. And let's look, how, how long is the kingdom of God described in its form as described? Who is in it? Where is it? And then does it give us any framework on one of our questions, the difference between the first and the second resurrections? So let's take chapter 20 and, okay, somebody get us started. I may stop you as we, we read this, but somebody get us started. The Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Now I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the, de who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Okay, so let me stop you right there. Now, do you think that John here was trying to be very specific who he was talking about? <laughs> yes. How did he describe him? The dragon. Yeah. Ancient serpent. Well, what's that a reference to? The garden. The garden. The dragon. The ancient, surf, the, uh, ancient serpent, who is also called the devil, in case anybody was unclear, and Satan, being very, very clear which character is being talked about here, and bound him for how long? A thousand years. A thousand years. So just as we unpack this, let's take it at its word. Now, I know that <laughs> there's a couple ways we can go with some of this, but for right now, let's just say right here, Satan is bound. Let's see what... Let's do this. Satan bound for a thousand years. Okay, verse 3. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him 
so that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be re- released for a little while. Okay, so, and there are other uh, scriptures in Revelation that talk about this, but what was the primary descriptor of the activity of Satan and what he was doing before he was bound? Deception. Deceiving the nations. And does that not also take us back to the Genesis um, Garden of Eden account? Okay, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they, were, they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so right there. These people in verse 4, are those the people associated with the beast and the harlot? No. No. Who are they? Martyrs. Yes, they are the people associated with the bride. And what was their role during this period of time? To reign with Christ. To reign with the king. So these, let's say the people and bride reign with Messiah. Okay? Uh, verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, stop. So what this is telling us is, again, as we're put, marking this through, a lot of people believe that this is the correct structure. Many don't. But we're just going to take it as we're reading it. That at the time of the second coming, there is a first resurrection. At that time, Satan is also bound. So at the second coming, there is a first resurrection, and those that participate in the first resurrection are described how? Read verse 4 again. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. And I saw, and then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Okay, now it gives more detail about this group that participated in this first resurrection at the beginning of this thousand year period that were resurrected and reign with Messiah. Now there's more information, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years is that not what we've been reading this whole time they will reign with Messiah they will be priests and they will reign for how long a thousand years, a thousand years. the kingdom of God Christ reigning for one thousand years Now, let's do more to kind of diving in on this. So, at the second coming, there's this thing called the first resurrection, and those that are resurrected are described as the people associated with the bride, and they reign with Messiah for a thousand years. Is it possible for them to die again? Because they died once, were resurrected. Is it possible for them to die again? Let's read verse 6 again. The devil, no, six. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And no, they will not die again. Yeah, they, they will not die again. They will not be subject to the second death. But then let's go back up to verse five. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were complete. So of all the dead they d- that did not participate in the first resurrection, they did not rise until when? The second resurrection. At the end of the thousand years. Second resurrection. Now, this question is jumping ahead. But if the first are not subject to the second death, are those that participate in the second resurrection, are they subject to the second death? We're going to see, but the answer is yes. 
Okay, let's go to verse 8. And let's see, let's go 8. Yeah, let's do 7. Go 7 through 10. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand, sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, so these things happen at the end of the thousand years. Satan is bound for a time. There is the rising of Gog and Magog. You notice that doesn't happen until after Satan is released. So whoever is involved in the battle of Gog and Magog, does it look like they are deceived? Again, there's this great battle that includes Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the, the city being surrounded, and then the fire coming out of heaven, destroying those, and then Satan and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. Uh, where do we leave off? Ten. Okay, 10. Well, yeah, go ahead and read 10 again. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Let him keep going. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found it written, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, so we've seen some structure here. If we read it as written, we're getting some structure. At the end of the thousand years, a bunch of stuff happens. Satan's released for a small time. He deceives those that participate in Gog and Magog war. They are destroyed at and around Jerusalem. That all happens around the time of this second resurrection, where all the rest of the dead that did not participate in the first resurrection participate in the second resurrection and then are standing before the throne, the great white throne judgment, where they are judged according to their feelings. Is that what it says? Do I, do I keep getting that wrong? What does it say? Deeds. deeds. <laughs> All right. They are judged according to their deeds. Now, those that are judged and found, how is it described? Any, anyone not found written into the book of life was cast where? Lake of fire. Destroyed in the lake of fire. But what about those that participated in the second resurrection and their names were found in the book of life? Reward. So does this give us some structure on this question? Well, what in the world? What's the difference between the first and the second resurrections? If we read it as written, it does give us structure. And it is consistent with everything else that we've been reading. Okay, so if we go back, Satan is bound for how long? A thousand years. A thousand years. Those that participate in the first resurrection reign with Christ for a... Thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, Satan is released for a small time. Gog and Magog, battle at Jerusalem. Second resurrection. All of those whose names were found in the book of life, reward. Those names not found in the book of life, lake of fire. So it gives us some structure there. So let's go back to this, the people. Who is in it? Um, let's read. Let's go back and just review some of this because... This whole thing about the first resurrection, there's a difference between what happens at the first resurrection and what happens at the second resurrection. There is no white throne judgment at the first resurrection, and there, is, there are none that are resurrected, according to the text, that are thrown into the lake of fire. All that participate here in the first resurrection end up doing what? 
Raining. Raining. <clears throat> All of them, according to the text. So, let's look more about who is in this first resurrection. Let's go to Revelation 5, 8 through 10. When he had, when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the land. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying... You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased from God, from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them to be a kingdom, and priests serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Kingdom of priests reign on the earth. Let's just make the list again. What scripture was that? Revelation 5, 8 through 10. And then let's, and we've read these before, but let's do it again. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Who's got that? 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, man, okay, just eight and nine, because obviously this links it to the Messiah. Uh, First Peter two seven. First Peter, chapter two, eight and nine. Okay. And a stone of no, it starts. Yeah. Eight on my side. And a stone of stumbling block and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, and they were destined uh, as they were destined to. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. The people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. Royal priesthood, holy nation. That's how he's describing the church that he is he's writing to. Now, this language, royal priesthood, kingdom of priests, holy nation, royal priesthood. We've heard this language before. Let's go back to Exodus 19, and we've pointed to this. So roughly 430 years after the promises began to be made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 13, and 15, we have the Exodus, and very short after, we have the marriage ceremony at Mount Sinai. What kind of language was used at that marriage ceremony? Exodus chapter 19, read 5 and 6. Let's just, and the whole passage is just fascinating, but let's just look at the language being used. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now that happened at the marriage ceremony. And it truly was a marriage ceremony. Now we know that 40 days later, Israel, because of their lack of faith, they were disobedient. They committed adultery. And they broke that covenant that they entered into at Mount Sinai. And that's when the Levitical priesthood was put into place. Before that, it was all under the Melchizedek priesthood. But because of the golden calf breach and their sin, and they're breaking that marriage covenant, we, they were given the Levitical priesthood until Shiloh come. But that wasn't the end of the plan. About right here, Jeremiah had a vision and was given a message from Elohim. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 33. Well, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with the, their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in them, and I will write it on their hearts, and, they will be, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Uh, continue on. So it's pointing back to the marriage covenant broken, but pointing forward 
to a new marriage covenant. And again, look at the language under the Melchizedek priesthood, a kingdom of priests, not one tribe out of 12, just the Levites and not even just all of them, just uh, the uh, uh, sons of Aaron could be priests. But the original intent was the entire holy nation was to be a royal priesthood. And then we have Messiah who came to breach to, to get, breach that, to fill that gap for Israel. Rather than killing all of Israel, Messiah came and paid that price so that this new covenant could be established. And you see that the language is the same. A kingdom of priests reigning on the earth, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And let's go back to Revelation 20 just to, to read that again, this language. Uh, somebody read verse 6 again. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So that royal priesthood. All right, so by looking at this structure, at least it, the way that I look at it, it gives us a structure to put all of these climactic themes that are coming to a head and actually coming together and being realized. But that covers a lot of data beginning of the thousand years, the end of the thousand years. Questions, corrections, thoughts. What do you guys think about that? We covered a lot of data in that one chapter, verse, uh, chapter 20. <coughs> All right. I feel like it's uh, Philip you got feel like this is the most clear uh, reading and understanding of what the scripture says. And again, we really haven't proven anything, but what we have said is, okay, well, what if? <laughs> what if we take the book of Revelation from a thematic perspective and we go all the way back to Genesis and look how these themes play out and look at the language that continues to be used and fulfillment of promises. Um, where the Creator really does, really does look at His relationship with His people as a marriage. Broken, what would you say, redeemed, but not yet the new marriage yet. That has, that the marriage lies in our future. The kingdom lies in our future. I think that's, uh, some people have, in my opinion, have this confused where they feel like the kingdom is now, whereas... You know, the language that Paul uses, yes, we're citizens of the kingdom, yet we're not there yet. We're exiles right now. So we're living in a strange land. And so while we're citizens of the kingdom, we're not in the kingdom yet. So and boy, it's not already not yet. Part. And, that's a, and that's, a, that's a deep study right there. But let me frame the study. We're not going to have time to, to flesh through it tonight, but let's frame that study. Because what we could say is let's go over here to the concept of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Either an individual is in the kingdom now, in kingdom now, married to Christ, let's call that option number one, or we are citizens of a kingdom not yet come to earth and we are not married to the groom but we are betrothed now that kind of reminds me of the jewish concept of marriage once you were engaged they called you married but you really weren't married yet that's right and what if while betrothed the marriage hasn't happened yet but you're betrothed what if you acted like someone who's not married? You'd have to divorce them. Yeah. It was, yeah. And is that not the story of Mary and Joseph? They were, Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but they were not yet married. But it was as a marriage. Now, that getting into a Hebrew marriage, that's deep too. And there's a lot of parallelism between a Hebrew marriage and what happens here. 
There's a lot of parallels there. But I think it's a, it's a deep question, but it's an interesting question because either the kingdom, it's, it's here now and we're already married to the Messiah, or we are citizens of a kingdom that has not yet come and we are betrothed awaiting the marriage at his yeah. second coming. There's a third possibility. Okay. Um, and I was trying to find where I read it because uh, we've been reading through Daniel Mm -hmm. This week, Daniel 7 in particular last night. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, Daniel echoes the scene where, you know, the throne was set in place, the Ancient of Days takes his seat, the courts are seated, the books are opened, you know, the beast is destroyed. Um, what's interesting, you know, it emphasizes that the kingdom is everlasting dominion but I'm skimming and I'm not finding what I was reading. But the, the third possibility is that the kingdom of God is simply, you know, everything. It is God's kingdom, but it's being possessed by the wrong people, and it will be handed over to the right people. Mm -hmm. We're the right people, but we're not possessing the kingdom. Yeah. Well, brings to mind Luke 4. Before Messiah started his ministry, he went out into the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil. And when he was tempted, he was tempted with hunger. He was also tempted with jumping off of the temple to demonstrate that the angels would save him. But another one was this. Satan said, what? If you bow and worship me, I will give to you right now all the kingdoms because the power of the kingdoms have been given into my hands. When Satan said that, did Jesus correct him? Nope. Mm -hmm. And even the apostles, they affirm that. It says the king, the ruler of this world is Satan. Right. Who deceives the whole world until when? Yep. The first resurrection, the beginning of the thousand years when he is bound and will no longer. Will humanity survive through this thousand year period? Yeah. There's lots of, lots of descriptions of that. And so as humanity is, is surviving through and all of the prophecies of Isaiah where his people are going to be rebuilding the land and replanting the vineyards and redoing all of these things, all this will happen without the deception of Satan until the thousand years are in, then he'll be loosened for a, a small while, there will be another deception, then you have the battle of Gog and Magog and Jerusalem and the great white throne judgment. At least if you take it as written, um, Revelation 19 and 20. Um, I guess I got, got a broad question for you, yeah. sort of philosoph philosophical. Do you think that this is a more of, of a vision or more of a um, instruction. Okay. You know, like, Develop that. I like so, that question. So it, what I mean to say is, you know, we can just look at this and say, well, there's a vision happening. Or do can we say, well, the original audience ought to have extracted something useful from this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... When Daniel was given everything that he was given, at the end of the book, what was he told to do? Shut it up. Shut it. Seal it. When Revelation was written, what was John told to do? Uh, write it down. Do not seal. Yeah. I'm trying to think, get the... Uh, There's another interesting thing, too, with Daniel. Daniel really wanted to know what it all meant, and the angel told him, well, it's not for you to understand. But for the people at that time, it'll be for them to understand. At the time of the end. Which is the last days, which has been since Jesus died. And then, I think consistent with that, what were Jesus' disciples obsessed with? The kingdom. And when 
they turn to Matthew 24, what, like you said, what was their context? What were they thinking about? What were they trying to understand? Matthew 24, verse 1, after going out, Jesus departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to point to the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see these things? Truly I say to you, there shall not left be one stone upon another stone that will not be thrown down. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples came to him alone, saying, tell us, when shall these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the completion of the age? They knew all of these prophecies of, this, of the coming conqueror, the judgment of the nations, the reward for his people, the establishment of the kingdom. They knew all the promises. And what did they want? They wanted the conquering king. They wanted the kingdom. When they were sent out, what were they told to preach? The kingdom. And then even at, at his first appearing, we're running out of time, they said, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? And what was the answer? No. It was for a time of the end. So revelation, as I understand it, and as I read the text, is a glimpse of the culmination and the climax of all the promises that, that the Creator has made to all humanity. It's not the only way to look at it, but that's the way I'm, that's the way I see it. That's the way I'm presenting it. It may be wrong, but that's the way we're walking through it. Now, next time we're going to go into some parables because again, what did Messiah say about why he spoke to the masses in parables? So to be hidden from you. Yeah. To you, it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, all thing comes in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. And then the last part is really interesting. If they were to see and perceive, if they were to hear and understand, then what would happen? Then they would turn, and their sins would be forgiven them. Passing from death to life is not, not the whole message of what was made possible right here. Passing from death to life the whole message. I would, I would also say the way I see Revelation too is I try not to mysticize it because I think when we do that we overcomplicate it and it's hard to understand. Do this what? Over if you over mysticize it like Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I believe the uh, revelation was given as a full revelation mm -hmm. up to the very very end which when you read it in context like you've been doing it across the timeline it's not really mysterious at all. If you let Scripture interpret Scripture. That's right, and that's my point, is Revelation isn't unclear. It's not mysterious for the most part. There are some, some things that are still being mystery. I was going to need you to explain that thousand-year reign after we're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, because, and, and, that's, and that's kind of the, the, the dialogue. Is it a literal thousand years, or is this a heavenly thousand years, which really 622.6 Days. Let's see, the problem know. with that is like in all of the other um, uh, prophets, time frames yeah. were exact. Get into the 70 weeks prophecy. They were not, you know, they were not these mystical, who knows, it's not, for, they were very, very precise. Very specific time frames. And the one, you know, scripture that people rely on, thousand years, like a day, day, thousand years, that was misappropriated across all of this because it hasn't, it wasn't even in the context of describing this. Yeah. It was just describing that time doesn't matter to God. Well, and now we're, we're not there yet, but there is a period that precedes the second coming. That is actually the topic of Matthew 24, and it's described in Daniel and others as time, times, and half a time. Oh, well, that must just be mystical. There's no way to, to figure that out. No, so, Scripture defines what it is. So my view of Revelation is it's telling us the explanation of the big parable, basically. Yeah. Right. It's tying it all together. And that is where I, I kind of hope to go next week to look not at all of them, obviously, but some of the parables that are all about the kingdom. Well, that kind of, I think I've said this to you before uh, in pro outside of this set setting. The first three words of the Bible says, in the beginning. Well, the, with those words, God created time. So he is outside of time. Mm -hmm. um, the first ten words, God created the heavens and the earth, and in there he created time, space, and matter. Mm -hmm. 
created everything that was necessary for everything else in creation was the first 10 words of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And then you look at it, if you think about that way, and you realize he's outside of time, take a box and put, we try and put God in a box when he is literally all around the box, inside the box, and he's much greater than the box. But then that is absolutely, I mean, that's the definition of omnipotence and omnipresence and beyond the limitations of space and time. And yet when he interacts with people, does he deal in time as we understand it? Yes. Now that gets back into, and there's so many examples of it. I was trying to pull up uh, Jeremiah when uh, he said, um, lie on your left side for Judah, lie on your right side for 390 days for Israel. And then he went on to explain these 390 days will represent 390 years of judgment and captivity out of the land. So even though absolutely he is beyond the confines of time and space that we are physically limited to, he communicates in time frames that humans understand, at least throughout the text. That's the evidence. Yeah. At least a bunch of good questions, doesn't it? <laughs> bunch of good questions. All right. So we'll tackle some... Um, uh, parables next week and pick up from there. Guys, thank you for reading.